Welcome to the Live Well, Perform Better podcast, brought to you by Below the Line. My name is David Duggan, and I am part of a team made up of experts from the worlds of business, elite sport, adventure, and health and well-being. We are coaches, mentors, and advisors to some of the world's biggest companies and organizations, as well as smaller businesses, entrepreneurs, and people looking to make their mark on the world. Our guiding mantra at Below the Line is live well, perform better. What does that mean, you might ask? Good question. Maybe the easiest way to describe it from our perspective is finding the formula that works for you when it comes to things like looking after your physical and mental health, running your business, developing your career, leading your people, or simply being able to show up as brilliantly as possible into your own life, both for yourself and those around you. That's why each week I sit down with a member of our team or an invited guest for a conversation that focuses on the question, what do the words live well, perform better mean to you? This question is a way into exploring with people from a range of different backgrounds, industries and disciplines, what are the practices, techniques, habits or ideas that they use to help them to show up and be at their best in all areas of their lives, whether that's as CEOs, leaders or managers, or as parents, family members or friends. We keep it short and sweet so that you can extract all the good stuff and get on with the rest of your day and hopefully put some of this knowledge, experience and expertise into play for yourself. This week I am delighted to welcome another very special guest, performance and well-being coach Tony Ogue Regan. Tony has taken his passion and interest for all things performance related and turned it into a career which he describes as helping people achieve things that they thought weren't possible or that they have been held back from doing. Highly knowledgeable, deeply thoughtful and wonderfully open, Tony gave me brilliant insights into what it's like to be part of major sporting success what it takes for him to maintain the standards of well-being and performance that he sets for himself, as well as why love should be at the heart of every team trying to succeed and perform in business and sport alike. Please subscribe at www.belowtheline.ie where you can stay up to date with our podcast, as well as exclusive online events and sessions, including our Press Pause coaching community and our story coaching programs. Thanks for listening and see you next week. Look, I'll just kick in with the first question, which is, um, tell me, Tony, why do you do what you do? Uh, For me, I think it's basically about uh, helping people, David. I think I get my greatest source of enjoyment and energy from just helping others, uh, whatever facet of life that is, be it as a parent, be it as a teammate, be it as a coach, be it as a mentor. Uh, And I think there's real real sense of uh, satisfaction in doing that and, and helping others to achieve maybe something that they thought wasn't possible or something that, you know, they were held back from doing because of maybe stress of la- or lack of confidence or, or whatever that barrier might be. How do people find you or why is it that they seek you out in your view? Um, I suppose different couple areas, I suppose from a sports setting, um, you know, working in the area of sports psychology or performance psychology, um, it's it's a growing field in terms of science as regards you know what are the practical things that athletes can do to build confidence, build motivation, you know deal with pressure, uh, think better under pressure, uh, train how to be calm in those scenarios, and you know we're we're now starting to evolve I think more and more into that area of sports science in Ireland, and it's become more accepted. Um, probably 20 years ago we had no strength and conditioning as a terminology in sports setting and now every club team and every county team and every elite team has a strength and conditioning team around the athletes so I, I see that evolving now into analysis I see it evolving into sports psychology uh, and there's more of an acceptance in it within uh, a team environment for sport and, and also within individual sport as well and uh, of course then in a business setting you know motivation uh, dealing with pressure uh, being more confident being able to be calm in stressful situations are really important transferable skills uh, and I found such benefit you know teaching I suppose managers leaders uh, and coaches around that as well like the limited insight if you like into your story that I have is you know you you are you were certainly a high performing athlete you still are in many respects you were also an accountant and that you know you've kind of come to what you're doing now via an experience or if you like uh, being drawn to it is that is that the case or you know how how has it come to be yeah, I think um, 
after after playing intercounty sport at such a level for you know over ten years of my life and and that kind of coming to you know a natural end, uh, you know I found a, a lot of reserves of passion and energy doing that and you know as an accountant um, you know I, I did enjoy the work I did enjoy aspects of the work I enjoyed working as part of a team but I, I just wasn't as passionate about the area as I would have liked and you know I know when I'm passionate about the area uh, time seems to fly by I'm really absorbed and engaged in what I'm doing and I feel I get the best out of myself so in order to find that passion you know I had to kind of do a bit of soul search around you know, am I going to be an accountant for another five years and, you know, not do it at the level that I'd be happy with. And, uh, you know, in order to get the best out of anything you do in life, I think you have to bring a certain level of passion and energy and have a, a really strong interest in it. And uh, for me, then it was about exploring, you know, what I'm really passionate about, what am I really interested in? And, you know, health and fitness is definitely one area, you know, and then the area of understanding our mind and our mindset and how that impacts you know, our achievement, our enjoyment of life and, and those different aspects. So for me, learning more about my mind uh, and how I could develop that and, and how important it was around, you know, high performance as well as, you know, our different roles in life, you know, has been a real godsend. And I feel very blessed to have the job I have. I don't even call it a job. It's something I'm really passionate about and really enjoy uh, exploring the research on it and, and using that research then to apply it to helping people in their roles, whether that's a young sports person or an old sports person, or that's a person in business, a manager or a leader or, or someone starting out in that course. Uh, I think it can all be helpful and impactful in them getting the most from themselves. Do you look at, because uh, you mentioned there, you know, strength and conditioning, for example, do you look at all those things and kind of go, Jesus, I wonder had I had it back in my day or in my time, or maybe it was there, I, I don't know. But do you look at that now and kind of go, wow, I wonder, or what if uh, you think back at your own career or your own uh, experiences? Yeah, I think uh, it's coming come in the latter part of my career where, you know, these, I suppose, multi-disciplines were, were starting to come in. And now when I see, I suppose, at elite level in GA in particular and professional sport, there's probably a more integrated approach as in how the SNC coach works with the nutritionists, works with the psychologists and how the management team and coaches also work with them. So you're given a very integrated approach in terms of your preparation and the model. And, uh, you know, it's been really beneficial when I see the advances in terms of, you know, mental and emotional recovery from stress and also you know, the, the level of detail in terms of the preparation that athletes go through and, and management coaches teams go through on a weekly basis to, you know, maximise the environment that everyone is really at their best and enjoying it and thriving. We're all the time pushing the boundaries of what's what's capable, whether that's our longevity or anything like that. And it's, it, is it the case that some of that area in, in sport is now trickling into other aspects of life or our existence? Would you see it like that? The, the number one thing I think that athletes are really good on is around recovery. And uh, sometimes when I work with business people, they really neglect that. And, and even people in society really neglect that kind of personal time for self-care, be it your, your exercise, be it your sleep, your nutrition, your movement, you know, what are the things that help you to feel well, think well and function well? Uh, and athletes know the importance of that because they're under the microscope probably every weekend in front of 50 or 60,000. So they, they, they do really max out on these things because they know it really helps with in terms of the recovery, not just from a physical standpoint, but also from a mental and emotional. And, uh, you know, 80 percent of my conversations, probably in a coaching scenario, is looking at those aspects and, you know, what are you doing outside of work or what are you doing outside of sport or outside of college that helps with you turn up and been at your best in those scenarios. Uh, and the work you do outside of that is probably more important than the hour training session or the hour meeting or the hour presentation uh, and that preparation side of it you know, can be so beneficial in terms of your mental health and your enjoyment of life as well. I often say to people in the business world, if you want to try and even get a, a scintilla of that high performance kind of elixir, if you like, you're going to have to do some of that stuff, which is often anathema to them because they've got a match every day and um, it's trying to get them to kind of connect with that idea and, and, and deal with the challenge of actually living some of that stuff, you know, because that's going to just create tensions in your business. Would that be something that you would see or agree with? Or Yeah, 100%. And I think uh, you have to understand what, what's making you successful on a, on a daily and weekly basis and a monthly basis. And 
what are some of the practices that I need to be consistent around in my role in work and outside of my role in work to you know allow myself to function really well the team to function really well and the organization to function really well and as you said David if we don't take time for whatever you want to call it analysis or reflection or time out well then we just stay on the treadmill and it's just a continuous thing where we're kind of getting lucky because we don't know what are the things we're doing well maybe what are the things we need to improve on and how can we do the thing even better and I think that's where sport is a great model where there's there is that time for reflection that we're not just you know busy always training we actually take the time out to reflect on you know what's going well here what will we need in preparation for the next challenge and the next opportunity and and how can we practice and prepare in the meantime for that uh, and then you know reflecting on there'll always be good parts of our last week or last day what do we do really well around that and if there was one or two things that we would like to be more consistent on in terms of our reactions in terms of our practices in terms of our preparation what will i do better tomorrow which is a blank canvas again and from that i think you don't just repeat one year 10 times you're actually getting better week on week you're getting better month on month you're getting better year on year and subsequently i would find by adding more value that way you know your your, your bottom line or your top line starts to improve or, or whatever way you want to look at it our strap line in below the line is live well, perform better. And I always say to my guests, it um, runs the risk of being frustratingly vague. But I'm just wondering, just from your own perspective, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think those, whatever you want to call them, mantras or philosophies are, are really important just to, you know, manage your attitudes and moments that are important. And for me, living well starts with yourself. Uh, you know, if I want to be the best coach or the best dad or the best mom or the best manager, you know, I have to live well in terms of my own health and my own mental and physical health and look after that. Uh, if I'm really struggling in terms of my health and my fitness and my mental health, you know, how can I be of best service into my clients or my team or, or my direct reporting work? So it has to start with yourself and, and having that, you know, boundary around, you know, this is the things I need to do every day. And it might be simple practices for, you know, 30 minutes or 15 minutes that allow you to be at your best when you face that challenge or face that interaction. And in, in order to do that, living well for me is, you know, the things that we all know about. Uh, the information is out there in terms of the importance of sleep and its correlation with rest and recovery from stress, uh, our mental health and performance and subsequently in our roles. So things like that, things like nutrition uh, in terms of our gut health, 80% of our, I suppose, our mood is dictated from our, from our gut and our microbiome. So it's just important to know that, you know, if I'm eating high processed foods, high sugary foods, that's going to have an effect on my energy levels and my mood. And, you know, when I'm reacting from, you know, place of tiredness, frustration, fatigue, you know, I'm not going to be at my best in front of my, 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 my colleagues. I'm not going to be in best in front of new clients, etc. So, you know, those pillars are really important for me every day. And in terms of, you know, a lot of people I work with could be on back-to-back -back Zooms like we are here now, four and five hours of a day with, with no break in between. And, you know, you're just seeing them when you meet them after that fifth meeting, they're absolutely exhausted. And how can their decision-making be good? How can their, you know, a, a level of awareness to not be reactive to another person or another person's emotional energy? You know, you're just so fatigued that that's how you're going to respond. So, you know, I always talk to clients around maybe, you know, getting 20 minutes of sunlight first thing in the morning, 20 minutes at lunchtime maybe, and 20 minutes in the evening time. And, you know, you, you tie it around. I'm going out for a sandwich now, right? Walk down to the shop for it or, or have your lunch with you and just find a near park or whatever and get that sunlight into you. And it will boost your energy. It will boost your mood that you're refreshed and going back to that meeting. And also the importance maybe of, you know, schedule the meetings. I would always say maybe, you know, if your meeting's an hour, you know, schedule 15 minutes after that hour for a bit of breather time. So if that meeting runs into an hour and five or an hour and 10, you still have five minutes to reset before your next Zoom call or your next scheduled meeting. And it's to try and give yourself those little mini breaks during the day. And they're a massive part of being mentally switched on, mentally focused and mentally alert for the important meetings that are on during your day, obviously you've alluded to some of this already but just in terms of yourself um what are the practices or habits that you would engage in you know daily weekly whatever to help you with with exactly what you've just described there keeping yourself at your best 
Yeah, it probably starts the night before for me, David, where my nighttime routine would be, you know, generally I'd like to get off all phones and, and TV and devices by, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And, and I generally go to sleep at half 10, you know, six out of seven nights a week. So that's a really important part for me. I usually wake half five, between half five and six every morning. And, um, you know, I, I try to have a morning routine there where, you know, I coach uh, business clients and colleagues of mine on, on the areas of, you know, mental and physical fitness. So we do a, a 30 minute workout using body weight exercises to get the energy up, get the sweat going, get positive endorphins through the body and, uh, you know, produce those magical hormones like dopamine and serotonin and, you know, oxytocin. And we also work on things like, you know, journaling, uh, just to set our intentions for the day around the person we want to be, set some targets in terms of maybe our health, our roles in life. And uh, we also work on things like breathwork, meditation and visualization just to set our mindset for the day and you know, show up as the person we want to be. So I would work on those things along with yoga, you know, four or five mornings a week just to get myself set up and do all that within an hour, you know, from 6.30 to 7.30. And then I have the day then to take care of itself after that between, you know, family and breakfast and going off to school and stuff. And, you know, I'm lucky enough I get to walk my steps on to school every morning. So I get 20 minutes of daylight there. You know, I collect them at half two. So I use that as part of my afternoon break and, you know, have lunch with him and do homework and get 20 minutes of daylight there. And, and I might have, you know, workshops in the evening or I might have a couple more clients then from four to six or four to seven, whatever it is. Uh, and I feel I'm in a good headspace for that because I've taken those regular breaks throughout the day. So, you know, they're the, the few things I feel very beneficial for me every day to, to feel and well, thinking well and moving well. And in terms of, um, we touched on this briefly earlier, but, you know, what are the main, whether it's well-being, health, performance challenges that you're you're just seeing out there? You know, you mentioned Zoom and Zoom fatigue and stuff like that, but anything else that you're coming across now or that you would see as being most common in your in your world? Yeah, I think we just need to be careful again that everything's opened up and there's, you know, probably multiple expectations of people again where, you know, we're putting maybe too much demands on people to, you know, fulfil different expectations in terms of their role and we need to be conscious you know what worked well during lockdown was giving people that flexibility in terms of you know I need to go off and collect the kids or I won't be in this morning till 11 o'clock and you know allowing them to you know manage those stressful things outside of their their work and, and their job and give them flexibility that when they are in they are going to work hard for you but we also have to be conscious of they have a family life and they have a mental health and the physical health to look after as well. So, you know, I think it's been really good to see uh, businesses, uh, you know, protecting that hybrid model where people might be in two days a week, two and a half days a week, and they're able to look after the home front then for the other two and a half days and, and do things in their own time at their own pace on the other days. And, you know, I don't think it's lower performance in any way. I think it's actually been a help. Uh, you know, I would work with a lot of people who would feel that, uh, working from home has been a godsend in terms of there's less distractions they don't have all this noise in the office other people on phone calls people coming in and out the door been called into meetings and they're getting far more effective work done in, in the four or five hours at the start of the day and you know subsequently then they're able to have more time for family activities and they're also able to schedule other meetings then during the week as well so you know, I definitely think there's a lot of good to be taken out of this hybrid working model and it's taking a lot of stress off people in terms of, you know, babysitting or, or pickups and collecting kids, etc. So, uh, you know, I think that's been a really positive for me out of the whole thing. Just going back to what you said about your own kind of practices and, and things like that, um, would that be your own kind of advice to people who don't have routines um you know uh that you would incur in, in terms of encouraging them to get into something like that yeah i think for me the reason i do it is because i want to feel that inner calm that we all have and i have a bit of control over myself first off and then control my day after that because it can get very easy to be reactive to other people's needs and other people's agendas and if we don't have a kind of a, a clear plan of who we want to be and what we want from our day and have expectations around that and we don't set ourselves up around that, well, then we get pulled into doing other people's agenda, other people's work, and maybe reacting to other people's needs. And, you know, the longer we do that and the longer we go on with that, I find, 
you know, the, the more you're getting pulled away from your own grounding and your own center. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, the things that you want to do in your life, you're not doing. The things that you're really enjoying or passionate about, you're not doing. Uh, and that causes a deterioration, I think, in, in your mental health and your enjoyment and life satisfaction. So these practices, I find, just help you to come back to, you know, that little intuition that we all have that, you know, we want to do this now in our lives or this is important to our lives. And, and it's just, you know, setting a kind of boundary around that, that, you know, I'm going to choose to use my time this way. And we do have a choice around that every day. You know, we have 16 hours every day. Yes, we're, we're working in a career or job that, you know, maybe takes seven or eight hours out of it. Uh, but if, if, if that's a career that you've chosen and you've choice and autonomy over a lot of your role, well, then that, you know, eight hours can be very rewarding and uplifting. And then when that's finished, then you have another eight hours to make a choice over, you know, what do you want to do with friends and family? What do you want to do in terms of your hobbies and interests? So, you know, sometimes when you ask people, what was the most positive thing you did in the last week? Uh, they can't remember because they, they don't do that kind of work. And for me, that's kind of worrying that your week has been a blur or your day has been a blur and you're, how much are you present for it? Uh, and if we're in that blur of, you know, overthinking, overanalyzing, maybe too much living in the future and I need to do this and I have to do this and I should be doing this, well, then we're missing what could be great about the present moment to experience. Just us talking here at this moment could be the best part of my day, David, could be the best part of your day. And uh, if we don't allow ourselves to be present for that, well, then we might take no satisfaction or enjoyment from it because we're thinking, geez, I have to do something now in two hours or I need to do that tomorrow. And, you know, we're just creating a sense of anxiety all the time around we're not enough and we're not doing enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there'll be people listening to this podcast as well who are working in business or leading businesses and going back to that idea of tapping into the world of sport and trying to bring it into the working environment. I'm just wondering, what do you see as being the key differences between sporting teams and, and, and corporate teams? And, and what can we learn from the sporting world that can be practically brought into the working environment? Um, I think first off, you know, it's deciding as a team, you know, what is the identity we want here as a group? What do we want to stand for and represent? That we all have a, you know, a common vision, a common value system that we're going to speak about, that we're going to model, that we're going to live. And there's a commonality there in terms of our approach. And I think that can be really helpful in a business team because, you know, if we aren't all aligned on, you know, what we expect off each other in terms of our behaviors around each other, whether that's trust and respect or communication and commitment, you know, they, those words are, are, are fine, those values are fine, but, you know, can we align around some behaviors around them that would really, you know, bring the team together and we identify with and we want to live? Um, and then, you know, what does like an All-Ireland success look like for this team this year in terms of the business? And, you know, what is my role in that? And, and am I excited by that? And how can we all work together towards that? So, you know, I think all those commonalities are really, really important. And, you know, what is the purpose of the team? Why do we do what we do? And understanding that and what's the mission for this year and over the next five years. So all those things, I think, really help with the motivation of the group, the, the, the commonality of conversation and uh, the commonality of mindset and, and the direction we're going and something just good reference points every day and every week to bring ourselves back to what we expect of each other and what we're moving towards and working towards and um, so you know I think there's a massive transfer around that and uh, it's a really really important thing otherwise there's a lot of separation in teams if we don't have that clear direction and clear value system and clear behaviors around what we want from each other. You just mentioned the word all Ireland there. And obviously you're a, you know, you played senior hurling for a long time. And I also know that, you know, with our, our mutual um, colleague, Jerry Hussey, you've been involved with all Ireland success. Wasn't it Tipperary a couple of years ago? Yeah, Tipperary. And I suppose most recently the Ballygona hurlers as well. So that's right. That's right. I, I um What's what's that like as a coach, as as to be involved in something like that? Because I, I can only look at it and be in the outside and you know say well done and all that type of thing. But just what's what stands out from those types of experiences for you as a as a performance and a psychologist? Ah, uh, listen, I think in in order to get to that level, you know, you really have to max out in terms of the group uh, togetherness and the group performance, and uh, you know, to see so many individuals grow within the 
you know, the, the season together in terms of on-field and off-field communication, in terms of togetherness and love and appreciation for each other. You know, that's the really rewarding stuff. And then, you know, to go out in a, a pressured environment like an All-Ireland final and see people really express themselves and, you know, bring all their training and all their preparation to uh, the forefront on the most important day, there's a real reward in that because, you know, you know you've been a part of that, you've been a part of the conversation with them, you've understood, you know, what the pressures are for them and how they understand that and how they comprehend it. And you've given them maybe some tools and, and, a, and a new perspective of how to look at it. And, uh, you know, to see that unfold and where, you know, a conversation you've had with a, a player on a, on a Wednesday where he was feeling a pressure around a certain aspect uh, and within 30, 40 minutes, you know, coming off the conversation, he's lighter in terms of his body language, in terms of his facial expression. You've seen him training the rest of the week and there's a lightness and enjoyment to him and you see him out playing the match and, you know, it's like a, a challenge game to him in terms of how he's expressing himself. That's very, very rewarding. And then, you know, the aftermath as well, it's just wonderful to see how it touches so many different demographics of people who mightn't even be associated with the team or part of the team, but it can have such a far reaching effect on the community in terms of younger and older people and, you know, inspiring the younger generation that, you know, it is possible to be absolutely excellent in your field. It is possible to achieve some of these things that these ordinary people do, but are, you know, are extraordinary achievements in, in ways. And, uh, you know, that's why I think it really lights a, a fuse in younger people that, you know, this is possible. And it also, you know, it's very heartwarming for the older generation as well to see it and be a part of it. And know maybe they've coached some of these players or they've, you know, supported them or they've grown up beside them and, you know, it really gives them a sense of warmth and positive emotion as well. So, you know, they're just a, a fantastic experience building up to it. Uh, and the aftermath as well is just so positive to see uh, the influence of it. And, you know, even chatting to one of the coaches recently to see, the cup and the boost the car and you know a 75 year old man come up to him and said can I hold that and you know he had seen a, a Walford team in All-Ireland in 1950 so you think of that like that's 70 years since a, a senior team in Walford at that level of one All-Ireland title and that man probably thought he'd never see anything like this again and you know to see him welling up and being very emotional about it and, and thanking him that he, he got an opportunity to witness it you know it's just phenomenal and uh you know, I really wish every community could get a, a sense of it. You, you, you used a word there that just jumped out of me, which is love. And I'd love to know, no pun intended, what role does love have to play in creating high performing environments? Because I suspect a lot of people don't think it has any role to play. But I think you and I would both agree it's probably central to the whole thing. Yeah, and it's something myself and Jerry Hussey would work really strongly on in groups that, uh, you know, Love will override fear in every single capacity. Like, you know, when you're doing something from deep within your heart, uh, you know, that logical part of your brain or that rational part of your brain will try to overrule you and say you can't or you're not able because of. But when you're doing it for something really strong, that there's a really strong why there, you know, it just smashes through all that. And, you know, it's trying to tap into, you know, what do you love about this team? What do you love about this group? What do you love about this community? What do you love about this opportunity? And if we're doing something that we really love with people we love, with love, you know, in my experience, things kind of turn out from fairly ordinary to being extraordinary. So, you know, within our group, we try and reinforce, you know, what we love about each other in terms of our personal qualities, in terms of performance qualities, in terms of what we add to this team and group. What do we love about the game? You know, what do we love about this scenario that's coming up for us? And, and rather than talking about the obstacles and the issues and the problems that are there, you know, we try to bring that overriding emotion of love to everything we do and a sense of enjoyment and fun and lightheartedness. And uh, it's amazing, you know, what that can lead to in terms of people, you know, letting down the mask and expressing themselves both from a verbal point of view and, and, and a non-verbal point of view in whatever domain they're in and, you know, I think it's such an important thing to highlight at all times in our life that, you know, we're, we're, we're a short uh, period of time on the planet. 
you know, we'll probably spend a third of our time in bed, we we'll spend a third of our time in working and a third of time, you know, doing what we maybe love to do. Why not uh, try and spend as much of our time doing stuff we love to do with people we love uh, and doing it with love and attention and care. And it also seems to me that if we're bringing love into those types of environments, that enables us to call stuff out because if there's more love in here, that allows more of that stuff. So it creates more challenging environments in a way. Uh, would you agree? Or Yeah, I think um, a big part of it is actually saying, you know, the reason I'm giving you this feedback because I feel there's even more in you and I love you so much that I'm, I want to offer this feedback to you that I think you'll be even better when you do this more consistently or, you know, you're coming in on late for meetings all the time. I'm kind of concerned why that is. And, you know, it's had an effect on, on my energy and it's had an effect on the team. So when people recognize that, you know, you have that love for them and that support for them and you want the best for them, well, then feedback all of a sudden is seen as a thing that accelerates your progress, accelerates the team's progress. And, you know, we're kind of wishing and wanting it from, you know, our managers, our coaches, our peers uh, and our teammates. And, you know, it can be a really, really helpful way to, you know, create real connection among players when we're giving that feedback to each other, both from a positive point of view and, and a helpful way of looking at improvements to get the most out of yourself. And, you know, I've seen it just really transform teams and organizations when we get to that place where there's that level of trust that we can see it's coming from the right place and it's coming from a person's heart rather than you know trying to be hurtful in any way or unhelpful in any way my last question is what's your one piece of advice for anyone who is thinking about how do i live well in order to perform better yeah when you throw that question at me david i think one thing that really resonates for me and i think it came from a talk i heard jerry hussey given a couple of years ago and if we don't make time for health we will force ourselves to be making time for illness or sickness. So, you know, as I went back to earlier on, you know, it might only take 25, 30 minutes in the morning of movement to make you feel well during the day. It might take five minutes of breath work to make you feel well during the day. It might take 20 minutes out in nature to make you feel well and have a lasting effect for the next two to three hours. So, you know, finding out the things and the practices that make you feel well are really really important for you know our longevity and life satisfaction and you know i think if we keep prioritizing stress and and the busyness all the time well then you know sickness and illness won't be too far around the corner if we keep pushing it you know i get fitter next month or i get fitter next year you know eventually our bodies will catch up to that and you know living in a state of stress will, will lead to you know that illness and sickness that we spoke about great great Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for uh, for joining me. Uh, you speak with great authority and passion about what you do, and uh, I wish you continued success. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to chat to me. Thanks, David. Really blessed to have that conversation with you today, and thanks so much for having me on. 